how many and there we go all right looks like we're looks like we're cooking with fire now hi folks see the first of you coming in all right thanks for joining me here tonight we just make sure I got my I'm talking too much alarm ready to go here get everybody in all right I think we're all set here we go uh, do we have our uh, our resident librarian in house yet There we go. Hello, everyone. Looks like we're we're working. Me and computers sometimes. Yes. Um, so, uh, did you want to do an intro at all tonight? Or? Absolutely. And then um, when I'm done with the intro, if you want to just, I think it worked super well for me to kind of um, be host control, so I could help mute everybody and and handle the chat while you were presenting. So maybe. If you want to turn me over to host either now or when I'm done um, with my little intro before you get started, either way it works for me. I think we got it right now. Perfect. That looks like we we got it. There we go. Yep. All nice. right. And the host. Okay. Cool. All right. Good well, it's good group tonight. <laughs> thanks for the thanks for the hand clap, Aaron Thompson. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hello. Good evening. Good evening, everybody. It's me, uh, Ms. Caitlin from the Oconomowoc Public Library, and I am playing librarian host tonight, um, although Sean is playing official host as our Colossal Fossils expert. Uh, welcome into tonight's program about predators and prey. I remember last time we were promised raptor fossils, so I know that I, for one, am super pumped. Um, we're going to go ahead and make sure we keep our uh, videos uh, off and ourselves muted friends tonight so that way we can just keep everything running um, as smoothly as possible and so that way we can keep the focus on Sean and all the awesome fossils that he's showing us okay so just remember to keep your video and your audio off if you have any questions or anything um, you can feel free to file those out in chat and I can either pass them along to Sean or he might be able to see them and answer them. But also don't worry because we will probably have time for a little bit of uh, Q and A at the very, very end. So you can also, oh, there's my cat. Um, <laughs> my saber tooth as I called her last time. Um, so yeah, you, you're right. Yes, exactly. Predator, apex. Um, <laughs> so yeah, we have, if you want to hold on to your questions, you can always hold on to them till the end. Um, or just put them in the chat and we'll try to get to them when we can um, throughout the presentation. So I think that's about it for housekeeping. Um, just remember that the link that you have for Zoom will work for the next two upcoming sessions in this series. I think we have Mammoths and the Ice Age next week. So that's going to be super, ooh, that's going to be awesome. I believe, is that a saber tooth? It is. <laughs> I guessed it. Um, and then the week after that is going to be um, Women in Science, which is going to be all about the contributions of women uh, in the world of paleontology. So that's going to be super, super, super awesome. And you can, I hope you'll join us for those two sessions as well. Um, but remember that if you do want to join one of the Tuesday sessions instead, you do need to contact your, um, your local library so that we can get you signed up for one of the Tuesday sessions so you can get access to that because that is a different link, okay? So just keep that in mind if you would want to do a Tuesday session instead of a Thursday session. And those Tuesday sessions are from 1 to 2 p.m. All right, everybody, I think that's about it. So let's remember, uh, camera video off, audio off, and uh, I think that's about it. Go ahead, Sean, take it away. All right, well, it looks like we've got a good group here tonight. Uh, thank you everybody for joining us. Uh, if you missed our program before, my name is Sean. I'm here in the Colossal Fossils Museum in Wausau, Wisconsin. And uh, 
I, uh, Sean is good, Cave Sean works. Uh, what I do here in the museum is what we call experimental archeology. span I spend most of my time taking artifacts that our ancestors made, building reproductions and taking them out and using them. I spent a lot of time living and playing in the Stone Age. A little sneak preview of next week's program and pertains to today's program. This is in fact a saber-toothed cat canine from a Smilodon fatalis. It is almost 10 inches long from end to end. The blackened portion here would have been in the skull. So if uh, this big kitty was to yawn, you would see this part. Very narrow side to side and sharpened with serrations, just like a shark's tooth. Now, uh, Esther, our Smilodon, is over there watching me. She's a little jealous. She likes to be on camera. Um, tonight's program, Predators and Prey, we're going to go over a lot of neat stuff. I have my little reminder alarm set, so we're going to have lots of time for questions at the end. So if you have those, we'll answer them for you. Now, I, I just, I, I'm sure I know the answer to this, but everybody here likes dinosaurs, right? Yeah. So predators and prey is a huge subject. And uh, well, it's hard to narrow that down. So we're going to narrow it down tonight. We're going to focus on dinosaurs, specifically dinosaurs that are really popular, well known, uh, with the exceptions of Triceratops and T-Rex, because well, we talked about them already. Now, predator-prey relationships or predator-prey ratios are something that's been present since the very beginning of life on Earth, since the very first time one animal ate another. That goes back more than a half billion years. That's billion with a B. Now, those very first predator-prey interactions they weren't really exciting. It was something like a slug or a, a pond snail sliming its way along the mud and eating algae and mold and stuff like that. It doesn't get exciting until we get into more active animals. Now, tonight, we're going to focus in on the Jurassic and the Cretaceous period. And we touched a little bit on that with uh, T. rex and Triceratops. You know, you've probably noticed behind me, we've got a, a little bit of a, a thing going on here. Now, this, this setup is a snapshot. It's a, it's a moment right before a very, very famous, really fascinating fossil. Now, fossils very rarely preserve direct interaction between animals. There's less than 12 instances that we have found in the fossil record that show multiple animals interacting when they were fossilized. The fighting dinosaurs is not only one of them, but it includes Velociraptor and Protoceratops. Now I can show you a drawing of it. We don't yet have a replica of it here at the museum. Definitely on the wish list though. The bones, when they were found, were in this position. The raptor is kicking and clawing at the neck and shoulders of the protoceratops. The protoceratops is biting the raptor's forearm. And just after the raptor pounced on the protoceratops, they ended up rolling around and wrestling. And all the ruckus, the commotion, caused an avalanche on a sand dune, which is a a big hill, a mountain of sand, and they got buried in a landslide in the middle of a fight. And that froze a snapshot in time for 90 some odd million years of these two animals actually fighting. So we know not only did Velociraptor attack living Protoceratops, but that it did actually hunt Protoceratops. Now, for those of you who know Velociraptor from the movies, especially Jurassic Park, um, they got some things right. They got some things very, very wrong. The first thing is the size. 
Now, if you remember from uh, our Triceratops last week, I am five foot six inches tall. Not the tallest Homo sapien walking around, but it's a good scale measure. Behind me here, a little hard to tell the scale on the camera, is a skeleton of a velociraptor. It is an adult, full-sized velociraptor. I'm gonna step back from the camera next to it so you can see just how big this animal actually is. Because it's not that far behind me. Velociraptor only stands about three feet tall. From nose to the tip of its tail, it's barely as long as I am tall in life. It weighed about 25, maybe 30 pounds at most. The velociraptor that they show us in the Jurassic Park movie is not a velociraptor. Now when Michael Crichton wrote the book, he needed an animal that sounded intimidating. It sounded scary. The name velociraptor means swift thief. These are animals that have relatively well-developed brains. They've got long arms with huge claws. And of course, on the foot, they've got that killing toe claw. But the actual animal is only that big. The toe claw made famous by the movie is barely as big as my index finger. Velociraptor was tiny. What's more, unlike Jurassic Park, they were feathered. We have multiple very close relatives of the raptors that show very, very good fossil impressions of feathers. In one case, so good that we know what color the animal was. Sinoceropteryx. And uh, well, it was the color of a modern day fox with a tail striped like a raccoon and a little bit of a stripe along the face, again, like a raccoon. And it lived in a very similar environment to those uh, modern animals. It hunted actually our ancestors in the underbrush, tiny little mammals like shrews. A velociraptor here, we don't have good feather preservation, so we don't have any idea what colors it was, but we know it was covered in feathers. We know its arms actually had wing feathers. Uh, now it couldn't fly, mind you, but it could use those arms to help itself steer in the air. So like a modern cat, it would always land on its feet. What's more, in the movies, they like to show the tails wagging back and forth, especially like they come into the kitchen and the tail kind of flops around because that's what we expect to see in a reptile. But the raptors were very specialized predators. The tail from the hip bone back only about six inches is very flexible. The rest of the length of the tail, it's very, very stiff. In fact, it can't flex at all. It's surrounded by something called an ossified tendon. And this ossified tendon are like rods of bone. So that means the raptor, it could move its tail around at the base, but it couldn't flop its tail, you know, like a dog or a cat would wag its tail. And that basically gives it a built-in balancing pole. So they're very agile, very quick to turn, and can even flip and turn themselves around in the air when they jump. Now the killing claw, I say in Jurassic Park, it's this knife blade for slicing things open. It's actually more like an eagle's talon. It gives it really, really good grip. So what our raptor behind here is in the process of doing is the exact same thing that a lion would do to a zebra or what your house cat at home will try to do to your feet. They'd sneak up as close as they could because the closer they get to their prey, the less they have to chase after it, the easier it is to get a meal. The raptor is gonna jump out from cover like what we have behind us here. And those claws on its feet are gonna grab a hold. The claws on its hands are the same shape. They're more like hooks than knives. They're gonna grab hold and it's gonna grip on really, really tightly. You know, imagine your cat pounces out from under the coffee tail, table, grabs a hold and gets a good grip on your slipper and kicks at it with its back feet. That's what the raptor's gonna do. The killing bite 
from a raptor is just like a modern lion. It's going to grab with its, uh, its hands and its feet and it's going to use its teeth to bite at the neck. The difference is, unlike a modern lion, raptors aren't bone crushers, they're meat saws. Their teeth are like shark's teeth. And uh, so it would be biting at the softer areas of the neck on our protoceratops. And we think in the fighting dinosaurs, what happened, our protoceratops got uh, caught by our raptor. One of the raptor hands grabbed around to grab the frill so that it could kick at it and grab at it with its hind feet. And the protoceratops bit its arm and started fighting with it. Our raptor, of course, at that point was just trying to get away because if it takes an injury to that arm, well, it's not as efficient of a predator. And that means it has much more difficulty getting itself food. Well, with the Triceratops being a great, 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 great descendant of Protoceratops, we saw where Protoceratops' defenses eventually lead, but like all prey, it has to defend itself from, from predators. If it gets eaten, it can't lay eggs, and if it can't lay eggs, then, well, natural selection and evolution wipes it off the map, and it doesn't eventually lead to, to uh, Triceratops. Protoceratops here, turn the camera towards Sarah a little bit. She doesn't have any horns yet, no spikes. There's just a, a knob on the nose here. And so she would probably try to, um, you know, butt heads with things if she didn't have any other choice. But we think that Protoceratops, very much like a modern bird, like if you've ever had a parakeet, and it gets annoyed with you, it can give you a good nip. That parrot-shaped beak and powerful jaws on Protoceratops were probably its primary defense. We think it, it would bite the raptors or whatever predators were trying to uh, make a meal out of it. Now, unlike the Triceratops with his short little front legs, Protoceratops is probably a reasonably fast animal, and the raptors would have had to sneak up on them to get close enough very much like coyotes chasing after deer in the forests of North America today. Now, just for the sake of demonstration here, to really contrast what Jurassic Park shows us, this is probably much closer to what the scene behind us would look like. Our raptor covered in feathers, well camouflaged. Our protoceratops equally well camouflaged, but probably not quite as fluffy, and trying to get out of the way of the raptor attacking it. We can look at predator or prey interactions in modern animals to get an idea of what this would look like. Neat little uh, piece of information that we can garner from that. If we look at modern prey populations, how many animals there are, and modern predator populations in the same areas. Take, for example, the African savanna. We have Cape buffalo, zebra, antelopes, kudus, wildebeest, lots of these grazing prey animals. Of course, uh, wild boars and rhinoceros, elephants, and even things like baboons. Well, on the other side of that, we've got lions, Thank you. Uh, we've got lions, we've got hyenas, we've got leopards, these carnivores, right? By counting how many of each group there are in a different environment and looking at what they are today, we can take an educated guess and kind of figure out were dinosaurs warm-blooded or cold-blooded. Now, would everybody like to know? I'm gonna guess the answer is yes. Yeah? So if we look at predator-prey ratios and the African savanna or the American West, we find in warm-blooded populations, things like mammals, like us, there's about 100 prey animals for every two to maybe four predators. In reptiles, it's more like 100 to 20 or 100 to 25, even higher in things like bugs. Dinosaurs? It's 
three predators to every hundred plant eaters. Uh, pretty much universally, wherever we find predatory dinosaurs and prey animals. So we can say pretty conclusively, dinosaurs were warm-blooded, or at least they acted like they were warm-blooded. There's still a little debate going on about that. But I personally think warm-blooded. After all, the ones that survived the extinction, modern birds, are very warm-blooded. Now, dinosaurs, like all other predator-prey groups of animals, the predator is always trying to catch the prey because they want to eat steak for dinner. The prey is always trying to avoid being captured by the predator because they don't want to be steak for dinner. Well, turning around and fighting like our protoceratops did is a tried and true technique. It's a, a method that works, but it's kind of dangerous for the prey animal. Most prey don't, uh, well, they, they don't like to get into a fight. They don't like to, to butt heads. Now it's kind of hard to see where I'm sitting, but right here behind me, we've got a little tiny dinosaur called Othnelia. Othnelia is uh, taking the prey side's number one go-to reaction when the predator side shows up. It's running away. Now, Othnelia is a really sweet little dinosaur. Unlike most of our Hollywood dinosaurs, Othnelia is surprisingly small. This is a full-grown animal. In fact, it's no bigger than a small or medium-sized modern chicken. Uh, the largest of them would barely be the size of a house cat. In life, we think they were feathered, they were active, warm-blooded, they were very bird-like. And uh, believe it or not, we actually find relatives of this little fella in Antarctica. Now, of course, during the Cretaceous period, Antarctica was a little bit warmer, but uh, it was no tropical island. It would be a lot like Wisconsin today with the varying seasons, warm and lush, full of plants in the summer. Uh, spring and fall would be intermittent, cool, uh, cold nights, warmer days, and winter they would have actually had to deal with snow. So we can almost imagine these little Othnelia as being like a modern day grouse or a ptarmigan. And they live in that same sort of environment. They live in woodlands and forested areas where there's lots of cover. They're fast runners, they have a short femur, a long shin bone, long tibia. When we see that in modern animals, things like ostriches or uh, cheetahs, it indicates that they're a very fast runner. Velociraptor back there actually has very similar proportions, telling us that they're a fast runner, but probably a sprinter. Othnelia, like uh, the raptor, has arms and hands. It doesn't walk on all fours. But unlike our raptor, you get a close-in look here, Othnelia is a plant eater. It's got a little tiny beak, along the lines of our ceratopsians. It's got cheeks all the way back to cover its chewing teeth. And they chew their food just like us. Like modern birds, the eyes are very large. It has good eyesight and a very flexible neck. So it's always looking around. There we go. It's got hollow bones full of air sacs and uh, thin but strong reinforced walls. So it's a fairly tough little animal, but it's very lightweight. Imagine a full-sized uh, real-life Othnelia like this might weigh four or five pounds, the size of a, again, about the size of a chicken. And we know from a couple of trackways that Othnelia and their relatives lived in groups. They lived in mixed flocks of different, different ages, different sizes, and they stayed together. In one case, one trackway, um, I remember right, it's in southern Australia, uh, shows more than a hundred individuals all wandering around uh, in and around the water on a, a lake shore. And so we can kind of picture them like these little guys. 
almost like dinosaurian quails. Now, I'm gonna put this little fella back down here. There we go. Now, running away is a really good strategy if you're a prey, right? Uh, horses, deer, zebra, wildebeest, pigs, uh, ostriches, emus, all kinds of modern animals, well, they turn and run. Now, one group that we absolutely know were runners, Jurassic Park shows us, but they get it wrong again. This is a Struthiomimus. The Gallimimus in Jurassic Park would have looked very much like this animal. It's what we call an ostrich dinosaur. And it's a member of a group known as the Ornithomimids, which means bird mimic. Because when its skeleton was first discovered, it actually, uh, it really resembles an ostrich. Some folks actually thought it might have been a prehistoric bird. But it does have hands, it has claws, nothing like the raptors. You know, they're little pointed claws on three-fingered hands. We think that because its relatives were, uh, it was covered in feathers, very much like a modern ostrich. But we know it was a fast runner. Now, this would be our Struthiomimus in life. Now, in this case, I modeled him off of a a local wild turkey because when a modern day predator like a coyote chases after a turkey, they tend to run off. Ostriches in Africa and emus, cassowaries, things like that, they tend to run away if they can. So I went with a running bird. Now, like a bird, he's got huge eyes, not very strong jaws. He's got a beak that's very well developed. I think they probably spent most of the time pecking and grazing. We know that they were on the lookout for predators. And neat fact about these guys, their eyes were so big that they actually evolved a ring of bone to help support the weight of the eyeball. That ring of bone there would sit where the color portion of our eyes does, the iris. And it actually keeps the eye from squishing itself under its own weight. Now we know these guys were fast because you found one trackway that seems to show an ornithomimid running along a lake shore. And if we have enough footprints in a dinosaur trackway to figure out its stride length, that is the length between steps as it's walking or running along, we know what kind of dinosaur it is so we can figure out how tall it was, how long its legs were, we can uh, go to math class and try out a little bit of advanced algebra, a little trigonometry. And we can put this formula to work. This is called the Alexander formula. And it's a little bit beyond me. It's a bit complicated, but uh, some paleontologists are a bit better at math than I am. Took this trackway and put in all the variables and determined this ornithomimus was jogging along at 35 miles per hour. That's faster than your parents are gonna drive their cars through the neighborhood. It's way faster than, uh, than I can ride my bike for sure. Now, what's kind of funny about that, we don't know if this animal could run faster, if it was just jogging along or if it was running for its life. We don't know if it was the fastest one or if there were even faster dinosaurs. You know, uh, Jurassic Park tells us T-Rex can chase a car at 30 miles an hour. Well, we don't have enough tracks. The only very short trackway from T-Rex that we've found uh, seems to show it's just kind of walking along at about three miles an hour. It's just sort of wandering and you know, lazily enjoying its afternoon. It's not going anywhere fast we have to find a trackway of that animal running to find out. Of course, uh, Velociraptor running as fast as a cheetah, like they tell us, I'm gonna say probably not. 
legs just aren't that long. I'm sure it was faster than I am, but until we find a trackway, we won't know for sure. Now, next up, we've got a really weird dinosaur. Uh, now this thing, it's a member of a group called Therizinosaurus. And the Therizinosaurus, well, when they were first discovered, we didn't find a whole lot of the bones. We found some, uh, some arms, some really big, gnarly claws. And this thing, it almost looks more like a horn, right? Like something a rhinoceros or a ceratopsian would grow on its face. This is a finger claw. Along with this, we found a couple pieces of tailbone, a little bit of a leg and part of a toe bone, and nothing else. The claw itself started out in more than 70 pieces. It was absolutely shattered by time and had to be glued back together one piece at a time like the world's most difficult jigsaw puzzle. And when paleontologists rebuilt this claw and the arms and hands that went with it, they got really excited. Because I mean, this looks like a raptor's claw the biggest raptor claw that we've found since is a fraction of its size. This is a Utah raptor's toe claw. So imagine a velociraptor bigger than the Jurassic Park ones. Six to eight feet tall, 20 feet long, more than a thousand pounds. And its claw is tiny compared to this. And this is the small claw from the Therizinosaur. The largest claw was better than three feet long the largest claws of any animal in the animal kingdom. Now, that's really neat stuff. These paleontologists think super predator. They start doing reconstructions of this animal based on these arms that looks like Godzilla with Freddy Krueger claws, 60 feet long, bigger and more dangerous than any T-Rex. You know, the scourge of early to middle Cretaceous Asia. Well, as it turns out, as is occasionally the case, paleontologists, scientists, they got it wrong. Therizinosaur was kind of an unusual example of a dinosaur that went from the, the predator side to the prey side. It started out as a relative of our Ornithomimus group, was our, our Struthiomimus. And over time, it just hung out at the salad bar and kept eating plants and well, they evolved into herbivores. They kept the uh, small kind of bird-like head, they kept the long neck, they kept the long arms and grew these massive huge claws. They developed a huge fat belly because they need that extra space to digest the plant matter. Because believe it or not, it's more difficult for an animal to digest plants than it is meat because of the way the cells are put together. Well, to support that extra weight, because they got so fat, their legs got shorter and stronger, so they weren't fast runners anymore. Their tail got thicker and a little shorter to help balance it out. And they became slow, chubby, plodding, turkey-shaped or goose-shaped dinosaurs, but with massive claws. There's a little bit of a mystery about what they were doing with these, but some recent evidence has shed light on it. Of course, one of the things we think they were really good for was defense, but it seems their primary purpose was actually to be used as a rake. Now, something Jurassic Park got wrong. They show the dinosaurs walking around with their hands like this, right? Like praying mantis hands. Well, dinosaurs couldn't bend their wrists that way. The reason we can as, uh, as mammals is because we spent time in trees. And our early ancestors were diggers, so they needed to be able to scoop. Dinosaurs didn't do that. Their hands always face each other like they're gonna clap. So Therizinosaur, uh, it's, it's always doing this with those claws. Now, I saw a guess in the chat, it was a little bit too big to be a dinosaur uh, sloth. It was actually about 18 feet tall would have weighed a couple of tons, roughly the same size as a modern giraffe. Now, what it was doing, what it 
seems that it was doing was spending time in sort of wetland areas, uh, you know, river valleys and marshlands and stuff like that, using these claws as a scoop, as a rake to pull up aquatic vegetation in seasonal floodplains. And once it pulled it up out of the water in these big, huge scooped claws, well, then it could use its little head to pick out bits that it wanted to eat, like a modern day goose would. But what we think it was doing with these as a secondary important function, defense. Remember, this is an animal that's shaped like a giant turkey, but it's got these huge claws. And it lives at the same time as a relative of T. rex called Tarbosaurus. It's a little smaller than T. rex, but it's a very similar animal. So this thing, it's slow. It's big, chubby, meaty animal. Not very smart. T. rex is going to look at that and think, yeah, easy meal. So to deal with predation, our Therizinosaur, Therizinosaur has an interesting defensive strategy. It's going to turn toward it, and like an angry goose at the park, it's going to start flapping those wings and basically clapping those big claws together. It's covered in shaggy feathers, and its arms have feathers off of them, a lot like our raptor. So when it puts its arms up, it looks really big. When it claps them together, it's these huge claws slapping together and slashing as it swings its arms. And well, I like to think it probably made a bunch of noise. So our T-Rex comes charging out of the brush. There is Inosaur, turns to eat him, takes a break from his grazing and goes You've got a fight that looks like this with our Therizinosaur clapping for dear life. And it might at first not seem like that would be a great way to fight a predator, but with those huge claws, even a T-Rex that gets hit in the face and say loses an eye, it's at a serious disadvantage as a predator. If it gets scratched up really bad and gets an infection and gets sick, then it's going to have a very difficult time getting itself more food, getting something to eat. So believe it or not, the, uh, the turkey clap is a really good way to deal with a predator as a soft, squishy, slow, not very smart plant eater. Now when it comes to defense against predators, one of my very favorite dinosaurs, probably my favorite plant-eating dinosaur of all time, Stegosaurus, has taken self-defense among dinosaurs against some very dangerous predators to the level of a martial art. Now, Stegosaurus is a pretty famous dinosaur for a couple of reasons. Now, it was actually one of the first dinosaurs to show up in the movies. Um, it was the first dinosaur that our heroes encountered in the 1933 King Kong when they go into Skull Island chasing after King Kong himself. Now, of course, King Kong is famous for the T-Rex scene, but they had the first, uh, well, active, running, charging, fighting dinosaur with Stegosaurus. Now, uh, it's kind of a fun trivia fact, but uh, King Kong, believe it or not, got Stegosaurus really wrong. Jurassic Park and the Lost World, uh, they got closer, but not quite. So Stegosaurus um, it gets kind of a bad rap. It, uh, it wasn't a very smart animal. Uh, most of you probably know of Stegosaurus as the dinosaur with a brain the size of a walnut. And, well, yeah, I mean, that's, there's not much going on in there, right? It had a head the size of a horse, and uh, that's its brain. Its body is about the size of an African elephant today, a couple, three, four tons, up to about 30 feet long, almost as long as a bus. I mean, they were huge animals and tiny little brains. 
Stegosaurus did not do its homework, uh, did not spend a lot of time at the library. At one point, there was even a theory that Stegosaurus actually had a second brain in its hip bones uh, where there's a nerve cluster, but that's not an uncommon feature of large animals, even among mammals today. It's not a second brain in its backside. But Stegosaurus, beyond eating, laying eggs, sleeping, and eating more, occasionally had to fend off attacks from a predator called Allosaurus. And to do that, we know it had the big plates along the back. What they miss out on in the movies is some of the really impressive things they could do with these. First off, like our Triceratops horns last week, like the raptor claws or the Ceratopsian's beaks, they're covered in keratin, same stuff as the fingernails. That gives the edge all the way around a sharp edge, like a blade. And because it's kind of clear, all of these grooves and pits and holes throughout the plate, we think were blood vessels. We think these plates were like a bright pink or maybe even a bright red, like the colossal fossil's footprint. So especially if the animal got, uh, got angry and tensed and flushed these plates, it could turn them bright colors, part they never show us in the movie. The bottom is not attached to the skeleton. Now this particular plate would have been attached to the skin right about here uh, at the base of the neck, just to in front of the shoulders. The largest plates at the lower back over the hips could be three feet from tip to tip and twice as wide as this. A couple dozen plates on an adult animal, all sharp edged, all flushed bright red. And if any of you have ever seen a horse that's being bothered by flies, how they kind of twitch their skin without moving their, their legs or shaking, Stegosaurus could do that with these plates. Every single one of these plates could move like this. Now initially, we actually thought that the reason they were doing that was like an African elephant does with its ears to help cool itself off. Now we think this was a display and defense feature. So imagine these plates are bright red, they're sharp on the edges, they're overlapped. So as it starts moving these, they clatter against each other, very much like a rattlesnake's tail. So you have a 30 foot long animal, the size of an elephant making a, a racket. As it starts to swing its tail back and forth and move its head and body, these plates overlap like the blades of scissors, it turns this animal into a living chainsaw. At the tail end, we of course have the spikes. A uh, little piece of trivia, if uh, anybody watching remembers the Far Side comics, when I was a, a little kid, I'm not gonna tell you how long ago that was, I really loved these comics, they were very popular. Uh, Gary Larson did a comic where there were some cavemen planning to hunt dinosaurs based on a previous dinosaur hunt. Um, one of their fallen comrades named Thag had fallen victim to the tail spike of a stegosaurus. And so they referred to this as the Thagomizer, uh, exclaiming that you need to watch out for the Thagomizer when trying to get your dinosaur for supper. The paleontologists who were studying stegosaurus liked that so much they changed the official scientific name of the tail spike to Thagomizer. So you'll get that one on trivia. You heard it here at Colossal Fossils first. Now, like the plates covered in that keratin shell, unlike the horn of Triceratops, that's round, that's just for puncturing, that's just a spike, Stegosaurus tail spikes are actually flattened a little bit. They have an edge to them. They're almost like a group of swords on the end of its tail. They're very sharp. Depending on the species, anywhere from four up to 10 of these, some of them even had spikes like this up on the shoulders. And unlike us, uh, when we bend, our whole torso moves. We bend mostly at the, the lower half of the torso around the belly and the waist. Stegosaurus 
was flexible like a snake. These animals didn't have any lateral stiffening. They could bend themselves into a loop, into a donut. So that means when our Allosaurus comes up to the Stegosaur, he wants to bite him on the head and the neck, but his tail spikes are 30 feet away. So he flaps those plates up and down, clatters them, makes a huge racket, starts curling himself around so those plates overlap like a gigantic living chainsaw. And then over his tiny little brain here, he's got his tail spikes. So that when our Allosaurus makes his move and tries to bite at the head and neck, those tail spikes can swing around and hit with huge force. We know that encounters like this occurred because we've actually found an Allosaurus skeleton that had a hole in its hip bone that matches the shape of a Stegosaurus tail spike. And studying that hole in the bone, we can see there was no healing that occurred after that injury, which means that Allosaurus died from that wound and ended up fossilized. Now, some Stegosaurus that added back up on the underside of their neck and throat even have little pieces of bone armor that have grown into the skin. So they were a really difficult animal to get a hold of. If you were an Allosaurus or a Megalosaurus, you'd probably look at it like that and then want to just turn around and walk away. There's much easier meals even in the Jurassic period. Now, to be fair, the Allosaurids and megalosaurids, they were not, uh, they were not helpless and they were not lightweights. The largest megalosaurs that we've found were almost T-Rex size, up around 35 feet long and several tons. Now, Allosaurus fragilis was more common, not quite as big. In the last uh, Jurassic World movie, they actually had an Allosaurus, but uh, well, honestly, they didn't do a very good job of rendering it. The real live allosaurs were really neat animals. They had ornate crests on their heads and along their snout, uh, little horn spikes that were probably brightly colored. Their jaws were flexible along the lines of a Komodo dragon, and their teeth were very similar. Very large teeth, narrow side to side, recurved and serrated, razor sharp, like shark's teeth. An Allosaurus at two to three tons and 25 to 30 feet long could probably swallow a hundred pound bite of meat in one gulp. They were really efficient meat eaters. And unlike T-Rex, they had obviously functional arms. Their arms were much longer. They had three fingered hands and the thumb claw, for example, can show us they're like gigantic eagle's talons. These animals were able to run up to their prey and grab a hold of them with a very strong, very solid grip, just like a modern day hawk or owl or eagle would on its prey. And then they could take this shark tooth filled mouth, this huge gape, and bite big chunks off of their prey animal. They were very efficient predators. And we have some evidence that they may have even cooperated in groups. Now we don't know if they had organized packs like modern wolves do, or if they just kind of tolerated each other more like Nile crocodiles do at river crossings. But we know they were definitely uh, coming together as multiple individuals in one site at one time around watering holes and maybe occasionally even around large prey items. Now, when we get talking about the Jurassic and large prey items, we're, we're really to the point where we're talking about the largest possible prey items that you can get in the fossil record. In the world today, the biggest animals that we have are the blue whales and they top out around 80 to 90 feet long. I think the biggest one ever recorded got a touch over 100 feet. They weigh 45 to 50 tons, but I mean, they can't leave the water and go walking down Main Street. The Jurassic period was when we got 
the sauropods, animals like Diplodocus here. Now, I've got the little model here, the little toy, so I can show you the entire animal. If I had the Diplodocus skeleton set up behind me, the tip of his snout pressed up against the wall and back, the end of its tail, about 15 feet of the end of its tail, would stick out the front door of the museum all the way over there. His back would be bumping up against the ceiling and he would be wider than the wall to where I'm sitting. They were massive animals and these weren't even the biggest. And we think that they were somewhere between 30 and 40 tons. They were lightly built for an animal this size. Their bones were full of air sacs like modern birds, which made them much lighter than, uh, than they seem to be and actually much lighter than any of the large mammals. Uh, an elephant and a sauropod of the same size, the sauropod would be much, much lighter than the elephant. Now, Diplodocus, when they got to be adult sized or any of the sauropods like this, Brachiosaurus, Camarasaurus, uh, uh, Titanosaur, um, they were just too big to eat. You know, at 30 feet long, Allosaurus is only as long as this animal's neck. So that is their great defense. They had some backup defenses, of course. The tail end, the last 10 feet of the tail is solid bone, very flexible. And based on the musculature and the build of the rest of the tail, we think they could use that like a whiplash to kind of squat at predators. With a 40 to 50 foot long tail, the end of that tail could potentially get to be moving almost as fast as the speed of sound could absolutely cause a huge amount of damage on a lightly built predator like an Allosaurus. But for the most part, these guys were lazy. They just kind of wandered around and ate. Oh, for a long time, we thought this long neck was an adaptation like a giraffe for feeding from treetops. And the Brachiosaurus certainly did that. Uh, like we saw at the beginning of the Jurassic Park movie where the it's got its neck way up and it stands up on its hind legs to eat from the treetops. But most of these sauropods were built like suspension bridges. The platicus here is, well, it's essentially like taking a cow and stretching it out to 100 feet long. These animals would graze from one end to the other as far as their neck could reach, just like we would eat corn off of corn on a cob. And they'd step forward and eat the next row all the way back. And then one more step and then back again. And that is what they did all day long in herds. You can imagine following these animals. It'd be like following a snowplow in the winter where all the plants are just cleared out as the herd wanders along. Um, bison back at the turn of the last century were noted to do that same thing, just leave torn up swaths of prairie where they grazed and stomped everything as they meandered in their herds. And we do think these animals migrated. They didn't stay in one place and just eat until there was nothing left. Now, to really give a good idea of the scale that we're talking about here, uh, <laughs> this, this is the thumb claw from the, forela, from the front foot of an Apatosaurus. Same shape, but a little bit smaller than our, our Diplodocus. You can see his, his little thumb claw on, a, on our model there. So these animals are massive. The foot that this is attached to would be bigger around than I am. We're not really sure what they used this claw for on the front foot. The best theory is for trying to step on predators that get too close, but we're not really sure. Now, because of that massive size, the only time these animals are vulnerable is when they're small. They actually start out in eggs this size. Now, this egg is smaller than a basketball. It's about the size of a cantaloupe, maybe eight, nine inches across. And this is as large as an egg can get. If it gets any bigger, it'll actually uh, collapse under the weight of its own shell. So 
a 100 foot long sauropod started out the size of our little model here when it hatched out of an egg like this. We know they grew very quickly. Uh, we think that they actually took less than 10 years to get from the size of a house cat to the size of a full grown elephant. Where we find nesting grounds like this, we know they laid a lot of eggs and we think they might have protected the nests. We really don't think there was a lot of uh, parental care. We haven't found a lot of evidence that the babies stayed with the adults. Uh, most theories, they think of them as being kind of like sea turtles where uh, when the little ones hatch, they all scatter into the brush and try not to be the one that gets picked off by an Allosaurus. And they eat and grow as fast as they can and try to get too big to eat. When they get too big to be easy to eat, then they join the herd and the process starts all over again. And we do know for a fact though that these are sauropod eggs because uh, the valley where this particular one came from uh, had eggs that were so well preserved that when they put them in an MRI and x-rayed them, you can actually see the skeleton of the baby sauropod inside the egg. Now, I saw my uh, little timer going there. I want to make sure we've got a few minutes for questions. I know I've gone over a lot of uh, dinosaurs here today. Did anybody have some questions or uh, something I might have missed in the chat? It looks like there's a long list of uh, chats. <laughs> I, I didn't see very many questions, um, uh, John. But yeah, does anybody have any questions? You can type them in the chat and I can ask Sean for you. Questions about dinosaurs we, we talked about today. I like the Allosaurus. Allosauruses are mean looking dinosaurs, but they're super cool. <laughs> they are. I'm still working on, a, on some paleo art for the Allosaurus itself. Uh -huh. The closest I've got is our Megalosaurus here, which is a close relative. And <laughs> You can see his little crests on his snout. Okay. Oh, we. Oh, cool. Um, we do have a couple questions coming in. Um, Somebody is asking. I. I think what they're referring to is when we were saying hot-blooded versus cold-blooded. What yeah. that kind. What that kind of meant. Because uh, they. I think they. They kind of took that to be like if you're running a fever, you're hot-blooded, uh, versus oh, so, the difference um, between mammals and reptiles. Hot-blooded, cold-blooded is uh, sort of the common terms for endothermia and ectothermia. And uh, the, what that refers to is actually the metabolism of an animal. So an animal like a bird or a cat or any of us, we are endothermic, which means our bodies burn calories from the food we eat at a high enough rate that the chemical reactions that allow us to move and do our thing produce heat. And depending on what, uh, what animal you are, endotherms, uh, warm-blooded animals, usually sit between about 85 degrees and 105 degrees uh, temperature. Human beings, the average is around 98 degrees. Um, an ectotherm is uh, often called cold-blooded. That means their metabolism, their rate of digestion, the rate at which they burn and process calories is so low that they don't produce body heat themselves. Uh, now there's a, a, a few parts, or a, a few animals that are kind of in between, things like great white sharks. Uh, they have a very complex blood exchange system. So they're warmer than the water around them but they're always about 10 to 15 degrees warmer than the water temperature. Their temperature adjusts with the water. Um, now, uh, an animal like a crocodile or even a tarantula or a scorpion would be cold-blooded, would be an ectotherm. Um, oh, uh, I saw uh, somebody, the, yeah, the leg bone is the femur. Uh, the microphone uh, might have missed that. I've also been talking a lot today, so. Sorry about that. Uh, egg bone is, <laughs> All right, we have a couple. Uh, egg bone oh, yeah, we have a couple other questions, Sean, real yeah. quick. Um, yeah, I think we cleared up the femur part there in chat. Um, someone is wondering how big are the eggs of an apatosaurus? Uh, so this egg comes from a an apatosaur-sized 
sauropod called Saltosaurus. And the, it would have been about the same size. Even the larger sauropods like the Brachiosaurus or the Diplodocus, their eggs wouldn't have gotten any bigger than this, about the size of a cantaloupe or a honeydew melon. Um, even T-Rex eggs, uh, we think they probably were a little different shapes maybe, but they couldn't get any bigger than this because if the shell uh, gets thicker so that it won't crack under its own weight, then the embryo can't get oxygen in and carbon dioxide out and it'll die. If the shell stays thin enough for the oxygen to come in, then any bigger than this, and it actually cracks and crushes under its own weight. An egg like this would be, uh, you know, about the size of a medium weight bowling ball and similar proportions. So uh, the size of most of the really large dinosaur eggs is gonna top out at about the size of a cantaloupe, you know, three quarters the size of a basketball. Cool. And All right. Um, there was a question. There's a couple more questions, although we're running a little bit out of time. So there's two more questions. I'll let you answer them in whatever order you want here. Somebody was asking um, about whether or not raptors run, which I think you said they do, but if you know about how fast they were. Um, and then we also had a question of if you have any more fossils from a stegosaurus. Um, so as far as raptors running, uh, we don't have uh, fossil trackways from, from velociraptors, from any of the raptor family. Uh, we think that they probably preferred very dry uh, kind of forested environments, areas that don't leave tracks very often. Uh, from the proportions of the legs and the size of the animal, we can look at, uh, for example, a cassowary bird is about the same size as our raptor here. And they can run around 25 miles an hour. Um, I've heard as high as 30. Uh, so that's probably the top end for our velociraptors. Uh, but if we can't find a trackway or a time machine, it's really just down to guesswork. Um, then, uh, sorry, what was the other question there? Um, the other question was if you have any more fossils from a stegosaurus. From a stegosaurus. Um, no, nope, a complete stegosaurus is still very high on our wish list. Unfortunately, all we've got is the, the single plate and the tail spike. Um, but, uh, well, our museum list, uh, wish list is <laughs> fast outgrowing the size of our museum. So hopefully uh, coming up, we'll have a few more Every, fossils. Like everyone this. go look in your backyards. <laughs> right. Well, and right here in, uh, in Wisconsin, you can actually find marine fossils. At the time of the dinosaurs, this whole area was underwater. Um, the Wisconsin State Fossil is actually the ammonite. It's like a squid with a snail's shell. Awesome. So if you're in the right part of the state, you might actually have fossils in your backyard. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much, Sean. Uh, feel free, everyone, if you want to hop on your video and wave goodbye. Um, and yeah, we'll see you next week for some Ice Age creatures. Ice Age yeah. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for coming. Thanks for the great questions and for joining us here at the museum. Uh, look forward to seeing everybody next week. Awesome. Goodbye, everybody. See you next time. Bye. <laughs> oh, sorry, Sean. Here, I'll give you hosting duties. <laughs>